Welcome to First Baptist Church of Terrytown, sharing God's love and hope around the world. Our prayer is that your life is transformed as you hear the Word of God preached today. I love talking about God's love. It's a wonderful thing. And, and this world needs the love of Jesus, the hope of Jesus. They need to know that, yes, even though you feel lonely, yes, even though it feels desperate right now, yes, even though there are huge divisions and there is no hope in people's lives, that there is a God in heaven. That's what that spire out there represents. That's why churches build them. It is for us to look up and to be reminded that there is a God in heaven who stooped down humiliated himself. He loved us enough to stoop down to our level and say, I love you. I care for you. Jesus came and took on human flesh, walked among us, lived the perfect life you and I can't live, died the death you and I deserve, and was raised from the dead. And that is because God loves us. He took the penalty for sin on the cross. He shed his blood for us on the cross so that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's how much God loves us. If you ever doubt that God loves you, look to Jesus on the cross. That's how much God loves you. I love talking about God's love. We need that hope. We need to know that there's a God in heaven who not only knows about us, not only when we accept Jesus, forgives us of our sins, but adopts us into his family. He calls us sons and daughters with the full rights of a son and a daughter. I love talking about God's love. I don't like talking about God's wrath. God's wrath is difficult to talk about. And in fact, in our current culture, it, it's, it's become a taboo subject. In the time I've done ministry, it's become, I've watched as it's become, eh, that's kind of hard, that's kind of difficult to talk about. So like, no, we don't talk about God's wrath. some things to share with you about God's wrath. But before we do, I want to know what you, you think. What comes to your mind when you think of God's wrath? Fire. Death. The flood of Noah. Okay. Adam and Eve. Sodom and Gomorrah. What else? If you didn't receive Christ, you'd be under his wrath. Okay, yeah. What else? What else, what else comes to mind when you hear God's wrath? It's kind of an archaic word, but it fully encapsulates what it is. Hard to change it. Justice. Justice. Yeah. The cross. Punishment. You're making me look real good here with these answers, kid. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what a great father he is. I assure you I am not. Anger? Yeah, okay. That's a, yeah. It's angry. You know, God up there, a lightning bolt. Or fire. Right? Burning down. Disobedience. Yes. Yeah, God's wrath. I, I think the modern word, as Ken said, is the best way we can understand it is his justice. And look, I, we need to we need to understand that one of God's essential qualities is his wrath, his justice. Just as an essential quality is love and holiness and righteousness. But one of those essential qualities is wrath or justice. And intellectually, I can tell you, like, we all want a wrathful God. We do. I promise you we do. Nobody wants a God who looks at Adolf Hitler and says, eh, you know, whatever he did, that's fine. No big deal. Come on in here. High fives. Nobody wants that. That's a monstrous God who does not understand good and evil. When you face evil in your life, you do not want a loving, cuddly God. You want a wrathful God who is going to bring justice into that person's life, right? I know the Christians are like, I don't know, should I feel that way? It <laughs> doesn't matter if you should, you do. We want a God of justice. There is injustice in this world. And we want justice. We want the God of justice. We want the God of wrath on our side. But really, it's terrifying. God's wrath is terrifying. The number of the images you brought up, fire and condemnation and death and exile. And the idea that there is a loving God, but he is also a God of justice and that he must punish sin. And that apart from Christ, there is no salvation. 
that apart from Christ, he sends people to hell? I am not comfortable with that. I am not comfortable with the doctrine of hell. And frankly, church, I have never met anyone comfortable with the doctrine of hell. And if you meet someone who is comfortable with the doctrine of hell, they're either lying to you, lying to themselves, or they're insane. (laughs) We're not supposed to be comfortable like, yeah, no, this makes sense. No. We're told in uh, the epistle to Timothy that God's desire is for all to come to faith in Christ, and he does not want any to perish. I think when when we talk about hell, it should always be with tears in our eyes because it is a scary reality. God's justice is horrifying. So then what's the point of it? What's the point of God's terrifying, horrifying wrath, his justice? Habakkuk, the prophet, had the same feeling that many of us do. That many of us do. And again, if you're here and you're like, no, I'm comfortable with the doctrine of hell, and I'm not. If you're there, I break open your hardened heart <laughs> and be honest with yourself and with God. It's not a comfortable thing to talk about, it's not a comfortable reality to think about. Habakkuk, if you recall, Two weeks ago, we saw Habakkuk. He's looking around the kingdom of Judah, and there's injustice and sin going around everywhere. Uh, They are defaming the name of God, and they are sinning against their fellow citizens. And Habakkuk is so angry, he accuses God of not even paying attention to Judah. And what are you going to do about this, God? And God says, oh, don't worry, Habakkuk. I have a plan. I am going to judge Judah with the Chaldeans, with the Babylonians. Then last week, we saw (laughs) Habakkuk say, wait a minute, okay, we're bad, but the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, they're like a thousand times worse. You're going to use them to bring justice to your lands? And God answers him and he says, yes, I am, but don't worry, I'm also going to bring judgment against the Babylonians as well. So it'll all work out, don't worry. And then this is the last of Habakkuk's conversations with God that were recorded in the scriptures. Chapter 3, verse 1. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet according to the Shigonoth. This is kind of like a a dirge, uh, sad music, musical term, um, mournful, emo music. That's too old of a reference. What's, What's sad music called today? Help me out. It's still emo music? Okay, I'm cool. Hey, kids, I'm cool. Look. (laughs) <laughs> so it's sad music. Chapter 2. O Lord, I have heard the report of you and your work. O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. So Habakkuk, he sees God is going to bring this horrible judgment against Judah. And then he's going to bring this horrible judgment against the Babylonians. And it's terrifying. And he says, yes, you are holy. Yes, you are good. And I've heard of your work, God, and I am afraid of it. Right? How many times do we pray to God and he tells us to wait and we're like, come on, God, just do something. Maybe you don't want him to do something. (laughs) Maybe him waiting is the less terrifying option. He says, I have heard the report of you and your work, O Lord, do I fear it. But in your wrath, in your justice, remember mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. Mercy is when your kid does something terrible. They break your favorite tchotchke and you told them not to. They break it right in front of you and then you go out and instead of of, uh, grounding them, you don't ground them. You let them go play with their friends. That's mercy. You don't get the punishment you deserve. In your justice, in your wrath, Remember mercy. You have to put yourself in Habakkuk's shoes. It would be like, imagine that you uh, worked in a warehouse, right? And you're, you're assembling things at the warehouse. And then as you're there, you think something weird is going on. And you find out that some of the warehouse workers, some of the managers, not the owner, but some of the managers, they're using a part of the warehouse to manufacture illicit, illegal drugs. You're like, oh, you know, 
this is terrible. What do I do? They're going to call the police. I, I know the owner. I'm going to go talk to the owner. I'll talk to the owner, and then we'll, we'll go to the police together. Right? So you, you go to the owner, and you say, hey, I, you know, I just found this out. They're, they're manufacturing drugs here. It's terrible. Meth. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come, and it's going to affect the rest. This is terrible. And the owner says, ha, don't worry. I've got a plan. Tonight, after everyone goes home, I'm going to burn the whole warehouse down. What's the problem with that, aside of the insurance issues? What's the problem with that? Yeah, where are you going to work? Right? Like, it's not where you're going to burn it all that. Where am I going to work? Where am I going to get a paycheck? I mean, that's the, that's the feeling Habakkuk has. Like he's seeing God's like, don't worry, I'm going to judge. And I'm going to judge. And he goes, in your wrath, remember mercy. Not all of us are, are practicing injustice. Not all of us are practicing sin. Not all of us are worshiping false gods. Not all of us have made ourselves the God of our own lives. There are some of us that still bend our knee to you. Please, in your wrath, in your, mer- in your justice, remember mercy. Are you just going to burn it all down? What's the point of God's terrifying, horrifying wrath? And then he's given a vision. Verse 3, God came from Timon, and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. What does it mean in a vision to see God on the move? His splendor covered the heavens, and the earth was full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand, and there he veiled his power. So this image of God coming, it's beautiful. But it's so beautiful, it's more beauty than anyone can handle, so he has to veil it, he has to put a cover over it. But It's amazing, it's beautiful, wow. It's kind of like, I don't know, it's hard to describe God's beauty, but humor me, maybe like something like fireworks. Have you ever seen fireworks? We don't see those all the time. But when they go off, they're amazing, they're beautiful, they're incredible. What kind of fireworks do you like best? Colorful, yeah. Yeah, large red ones that scatter. What else? A smiley face one? That's cool. I haven't seen that. I like the ones that they go up and they go, and then they like come out like a little crackle, spidery legs. Those are, they like look like they're coming right at you. You know, fireworks are beautiful unless the firework is directed at you and it's coming for you, right? Then it's terrifying. And then you're like, oh, I wonder what kind that is. Hmm, you know? <laughs> no, you don't care. It's like, this is coming towards me. That's what's about to happen here. Wow, look at God's beauty. Ah, oh, it's amazing. And then Habakkuk sees the terror of God. Verse five, before him went pestilence. And plague followed at his heels. He stood and measured the earth, and he looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered, and the everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Cushion in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the earth, you stripped the sheath from your bow, calling for many arrows, Selah. So God, he's coming with his his battle bow, and he takes the bow out, and he pulls and knocks an arrow right directed towards everything Habakkuk loves. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place as the light of your arrows as they sped at the flash of your glittering spear. You marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. A lot of images here. God's presence come and the very mountains tremble at his presence. Raging waters are flushing before him and rushing before him. It's terrifying. He's shooting these arrows. He has this spear. 
You march through the earth in fury. You thresh the nations in anger. He's got a scythe just picking nations apart. God's wrath is terrifying. What is the point of God's terrifying wrath? You think about the things we've seen on the news, the earthquakes, all of the hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires. If you've ever been in or around a wildfire, it is terrifying. Even near one is terrifying. What is the point of God's terrifying wrath? In the movie Knowing with Nick Cage, which is actually a pretty good Nick Cage movie, he shows, and there, there's an image of the earth getting too close to the sun and being destroyed. And I, I, I've seen this clip a number of times, and I think this really, to some extent, kind of captures the terror, the, the, the power, the magnitude of God's wrath. Go ahead and show this. This isn't the end, son. I know. God's wrath is more powerful than that and more terrifying. What's the point? Habakkuk gives us the answer in verse 13. Why is God doing this? Why is he making the mountains tremble? Why is he threshing the nations like a harvester? Verse 13 You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck, Selah. You pierced with his own arrows the head of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters." Habakkuk realizes in this vision the point of God's terrifying, horrifying wrath is to rescue his people. It's to rescue his people from the evil on the earth. Last week we saw sometimes God will use evil to destroy evil. But there is a point in human history when things are so bad that nothing can stop it. There is a point in human history where things are so bad, there's nothing we can do. We are powerless in the face of it. In the Old Testament, it is called the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, when God will come and bring justice, final solutions, final goodness into the world. There is a point in the New Testament They pick up this idea, it's progressive revelation, where God says, I am going to bring goodness and light through the person of Jesus Christ. The day of the Lord in the Old Testament is the day of the Lord in the New Testament. It is when King Jesus comes and he finally makes things the way they ought to be, not the way they currently are. The day of the Lord is when God comes in power, not to destroy his people, but to destroy wickedness and to destroy evil. The purpose of God's terrifying, horrifying wrath is to rescue his people, is to rescue us, is to protect us. It's to save his people. Verse 16 
Habakkuk sees all this. He says, I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invaded us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold and there will be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes my thre- tread on, He makes me tread on high places. The choir master with stringed instruments. So he set this to music. It's incredible. He ends his whole vision rejoicing in God. But if you read the end of it, Habakkuk has nothing. He has nothing. He says, even if the crops fail, which means I'm going to starve, even if my financial situation crumbles to dust, I am still going to praise God because he understands that though things seem dark now, though things seem impossible right now, he has now seen a vision that God is at work and that God's terrifying power is on his side. It's for him. It's not going to destroy him because he knows he belongs to God and God belongs to him because he is trusted in the one true God. Though the fig tree should not blossom nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herds in the stall. Yet I will rejoice. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. We understand from the New Testament, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ, your sins have been forgiven. Your sins have been washed clean. You are now no longer under condemnation. You are now no longer under wrath. You no longer have to fear the wrath, not because of you, not because of your good deeds, not because of who you are, but because of who Jesus is. And that Jesus took the penalty for sin and God's wrath on the cross. If you have trusted in Jesus, you no longer fear God's wrath, but instead God's wrath is justice for you. God's wrath is justice that goes marching out against evil and wickedness in our powerlessness to defend us. And Habakkuk, I don't know if he experienced that in his day, but he saw a vision of it and he knew God's character and he knew what God said would come to pass and he trusted God. And even though he said, I realize that right now my life is going to fall apart, I understand that evil is still incredibly powerful, still I rejoice because I know that my God is good at his word. And he's going to right every wrong. God is powerful enough to stop the evil even when I'm not. The point of God's terrifying wrath is to save his people. We've seen throughout the Bible God using his wrath to deliver his people before, haven't we? You remember the Exodus story with Moses, let my people go, and God brought the 10 plagues, or actually, as our our Jewish friends correctly call it, the 10 miracles upon Egypt, showing his wrath, all of those terrible, awful things that happened to them. He used that to deliver his people in the same way God's power, his strength, his justice will deliver his people. And just like Habakkuk, we need to have the attitude that, look, this is not the way things ought to be in this world. We all understand that. God loves us. He cares for us. But he waits to make all things new until every man, woman, and child who is going to accept Jesus Christ has accepted Jesus Christ. Until the gospel has gone to the four corners of the earth and men and women and children are renewed and transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why he waits. And that's why we suffer in this fallen world, which is not the way things ought to be. But we know that one day King Jesus will return. He will make things the way they ought to be, not the way that they currently are. Everyone knows. Solomon says in Ecclesiastes that that God has put eternity in our hearts. There isn't anyone who thinks that this life and the suffering and the pain and the torment that we all go through is the way things should be. Everyone understands that this isn't right, that there is a better world. There is a better something. And one day King Jesus will come. He will renew the earth and things will finally be the way they ought to be. 
and he will come back in justice and wrath to undo evil, to wipe it from the earth, reform the earth, reform, resurrect our bodies, transform us, wipe every tear from our eyes, and life will finally be the way it should be. Your pain that you're going through now has a purpose. God sees, God hears, God knows, God loves, God cares. You're not suffering in the body or in your society alone. God knows. He has a plan. He has a purpose. And one day, King Jesus will come back. And I don't know how he'll do it, but he'll make it up to you. I don't know how he can make up to you the lost years with loved ones. I don't know how he can make up to you the abuse that you've suffered at the hands of evil and wicked people. I don't know how he can make up to us the the devastation we've experienced in our lives, the financial ruin some of us have faced, the anger and the hatred and the frustrations that have been targeted at us. I don't understand. My imagination isn't big enough, but Paul said, that when King Jesus comes back, our present suffering won't be worth comparing to the future glory that we have in Christ Jesus. There is something better for those who have followed Christ. The purpose of God's terrifying wrath is to save his people. But make sure you're one of his people. Make sure you're on God's side. And the way that you do that is you trust that Jesus died for your sins and rose again. If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. Our sins are forgiven. We are adopted into God's family. We are given meaning and purpose and value, and we gain an inheritance in the new heaven and new earth, which is coming one day when King Jesus returns. We no longer have to fear God's wrath, his condemnation. His justice is on your side. That's the point of the wrath. But make sure, make sure you belong to God. Make sure you belong to Jesus. Make sure that you're on the right side. Let's pray. Father, I pray for our congregation right now. Your wrath is still terrifying, even though I know that that, that is for me and and for us and and to protect us from evil it is still terrifying you are god and we are not your ways are so much higher you are a god of justice thank you that through the blood of jesus we do not have to pay the penalty for our own sin but jesus took the penalty for sin on the cross his blood was shed for us so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And God, you didn't leave us here as orphans. No, when Jesus was raised from the dead and ascended into heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to come and dwell within all believers to lead, to guide, to protect, to remind us that this is not the way things ought to be and that one day when King Jesus returns, we will have an inheritance in the new heaven and the new earth. May we be like Habakkuk and have confidence on that day. Have confidence that that day is coming. Have confidence and be able to say, even if our bank account is empty, even if our economy falls apart, even if we have family members and loved ones who depart from us or are angry with us or want nothing to do with us, even if we're reviled and made fun of, even if we have the worst diseases, even if natural catastrophe destroys our lives and destroys our home, yet we will still rejoice because, God, you can be trusted with your promises and our present suffering is not worth comparing to the future glory that we have in Christ Jesus. Father, I pray for those who are here that are hurting. Give them that vision of your justice on their side coming with glory. For those who are here that have not trusted in Jesus Christ, I pray that they will experience his forgiveness, his freedom, his hope. They'll believe that he died on the cross for their sins and rose again. Father, may we have trust in you. May we rejoice as Habakkuk did, even with trembling arms and legs. My God lives. He sees He knows, he hears, he remembers his people. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about the church or make an online donation, please visit us at fbcterrytown.org.